Right, our next speaker is Nicholas Longwich, who's going to talk about tetrapod of pod of this. <laughs> Close enough. Hi. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Tetrapodophus amplectus, a four-legged snake from the early Cretaceous of Gondwana. To summarize what I'm going to talk about here today, snakes are a diverse and very successful group today, but their origins and evolution have been obscure. Uh, I'm interested in three primary questions here. First, how did the body plan originate, the elongate body plan of snakes? Is it an adaptation for a marine ecosystem, or did it evolve in a terrestrial ecosystem? What was the ancestral feeding strategy? Were early snakes insectivorous or carnivorous? And third, where on the planet did the clade originate? To answer these questions, we need new fossils. And now a new fossil from the early Cretaceous of South America can help resolve the origins and evolution of snakes. So snakes are really a remarkable evolutionary success story. There's over 3,000 known species of snakes. This makes them one of the most diverse groups of tetrapods, which is really ironic because tetrapoda means four feet. It's the classic adaptation of the tetrapods, and snakes don't have feet. Despite this, or perhaps because of this, snakes are capable of a remarkable range of locomotor strategies. Snakes are capable of crawling, snakes can climb, they can burrow, they can swim. Some snakes are actually capable of flight. And this has allowed them to exploit environments from deep oceans to deserts to rainforests. In terms of feeding, snakes are remarkably versatile. They're all predators, but they eat an extraordinary range of food items. They eat things like insects, worms, snails, fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, eggs, small mammals, large mammals, pretty much everything. And they can eat very large things. They can eat prey items equal to their own body mass. So imagine turning to the person next to you, unhinging your jaws, <laughs> swallowing them whole, and not eating for two or three months. That's how snakes feed. To make this possible, they have an extraordinarily flexible skeleton. Uh, basically, the entire skull, upper and lower jaws, have a series of hinges. They can expand the gape. Uh, they've lost the sternum and pectoral girl, so they can throw the rib cage open like this to swallow very large prey items. They also have a number of adaptations that facilitate prey capture. Uh, they have these very long uh, hooked or, or claw-like teeth, fangs, to secure the prey items. A number of snakes are capable of using constriction <laughs> to grasp their prey and shut off blood flow to the brain, causing them to lose consciousness. And a number of snakes have cytotoxic or neurotoxic proteins in their saliva, venom, to help incapacitate their prey. So where does this remarkable, or where does this remarkable clade come from? First of all, how does this elongate body plan evolve? How did the early snakes feed? And how did that evolve? And where did snakes originate? So there are several different hypotheses in terms of the origin of the body plan. Uh, one of these is the, the first hypothesis is the marine origins hypothesis. And Edward Drinker Cope back in the 1800s argued that snakes were related to the long-bodied marine mosasaurs. And the long body was a swimming adaptation. And consistent with this, some of the earliest snakes we have are these things called Smoliotheids. They're uh, mid-Cretaceous snakes, very primitive. They actually have small hind limbs. They have, a, they have a femur, they have a knee, they have an ankle. And these have been proposed as transitional between the marine mosasaurs, these are giant marine lizards, and later snakes. The other hypothesis has been based on a study of the anatomy of living snakes. And they show a number of features that are common in burrowing lizards. So, for example, snakes don't have eyelids. That's a common feature in burrowing lizards. It prevents dirt and sand from getting inside the eye. They show simplification of the, of the, of the eye and loss of photoreceptors. If you're navigating underground and living in total darkness, it doesn't really, there's no really point in having elaborate eyes. They've lost the external ears. Again, it presents, prevents dirt from getting in there. And they have an elaborate inner ear to detect vibrations. All of these features are common in burrowing lizards, such as this worm lizard, suggesting there might be a burrowing origin to the group. There is further evidence for a burrowing ancestry uh, from the fossils. Uh, this is Coniophus, a stem snake from the Cretaceous. It has these very low, broad vertebrae, which is a classic burrowing adaptation. Uh, Najash here, it's got little legs there. This is a two-legged snake from the Cretaceous. Again, it's a stem snake. It has adaptations consistent with burrowing. Furthermore, these uh, marine snakes that have been proposed as transitional are increasingly thought to be part of the crown, that is, they're modern snakes and not proto-snakes at all. In terms of feeding evolution, uh, this is also a complicated problem. So a lot of the uh, most ancient branches of the snake tree, things like these blind snakes, are insectivorous. And so it's been thought that constriction and carnivory were derived within modern snakes. However, we have stem snakes like Coniophis here that have very large uh, hooked teeth suitable for preying on vertebrates. And this, this implies that carnivory, not insectivory, might be ancestral for snakes. 
Uh, finally, biogeography. So based on molecular data, the sister taxa of snakes are uh, iguanas and monitor lizards. And both of these groups are primarily Laurasian during the Cretaceous. We also have some proto-snakes in Laurasia, like Coniophis from North America, suggesting at least the stem of snakes might come from, from the northern hemisphere and perhaps snakes themselves. However, the highest diversity of snakes in the Cretaceous comes from South America. Things like Dinalysia here, Najash, et cetera, are being found in South America. There's a high diversity in Africa, also India and Madagascar, suggesting that perhaps the snake crown is coming from Gondwana. So how do we answer these questions? The problem here is the snake record is highly incomplete. And it's not until you start working on snakes you start realizing and start like, man, I wish I worked on hominids. Those guys have so many fossils. <laughs> it's, it's that bad. I mean, I, I thought birds was bad, but you know, snakes are really bad. So, so to resolve these issues, we need to turn to the fossil record. Uh, so we need more fossils. How do you get them? Well, it's not like someone's just going to go to a museum display and see some amazing proto-snake on display. It's not like you're going to go to a pub and somebody's going to turn to you and say, hey, mate, I've got a four-legged snake. Isn't that cool? Uh, and yet, that's precisely what happened here. Uh, so this fossil was discovered uh, on, it was a part of a private collection that was on display in Germany. It was discovered by my colleague David Martill, who later told me about it. And it is really a spectacular fossil. It, it consists of the part and counterpart. It's virtually complete. There's the entire skeleton preserved in articulation with soft tissue preservation. Based on the preservation of the bone and soft tissues, the color of the matrix, the texture, the bedding, uh, the associated, there's these little uh, micro fossils there, fish coprolites. It comes from the, uh, the Nova Alinda member of the Crotto Formation of Brazil. And the Crotto is early Cretaceous, thought to be Appian or perhaps older, making this the earliest definitive member of the snake lineage, if it is a snake. And this could potentially answer our questions. So we've got this beautiful little proto snake here. Uh, there's a catch. It's got legs and it's got four of them. And so I tell people, yeah, we've got a four-legged snake. And they go, well, that's not a snake. That's a lizard, right? I'm like, well, yeah, but morphology and DNA both tell us that snakes are lizards, just really, really weird ones. And if snakes do, in fact, descend from lizards, if you go far enough down the tree, you're eventually going to find something that has arms and legs. So that doesn't mean it can't be a snake. The problem, however, is that a long body and reduced limbs don't make you a snake. Lizards have done this over and over and over again. And so when I heard about this thing being a snake, I figured it's probably just another one of these long-bodied lizard lineages. So we have long-bodied snake like geckos. Uh, it's happened twice in the alligator lizards, things like slow worms, uh, multiple times in skinks. Uh, there's a group called dibamids, and this cute little guy here is called a worm lizard. So this has happened dozens of times. Why do we think this is a snake and not some other type of long-bodied lizard? So I started looking at snake apomorphies, and it turns out to be full of them. It's got these very long, recurved teeth. It's got horizontal replacement teeth, which is a snake on tapomorphy, interdental ridges separating the teeth, deep subdental ridge of the dentary. It's got a, a hinge there to swallow large prey items. This has the skull of a snake. Moving into the spine, and it has over 150 vertebrae. No other lizard, does, lizard group does that. That's a snake feature. Uh, the vertebrae here, the way they interlock, is typical of snakes. A bunch of other features of the ribs and vertebrae I won't bore you with, but they're snake apomorphies. The legs are snake-like, which seems like a contradiction, but the, uh, it has this long curved rod-like ilium, like Najash and the Smoleophyids, and a bowed fibula, which is typical, again, of Najash and the Smoleophyids. <laughs> the legs are snake-like. The skin is snake-like. So it has these vent large overlapping ventral scales, these transverse scales, that's not a reptile feature. That's not a lizard feature. That is a snake feature of the integument, and this animal shows it. Behavioral apomorphies. There's this large phosphatic mass preserved in the gut there. Under fluorescence, you see these little bits of bone. It swallowed another tetrapod. It eats like a snake. It's a carnivore. So all of these features show that it's a snake. When you throw it into a phylogenetic analysis, it comes out near the base of the snake radiation. Uh, Coniophis might go down there, too. It's pretty fragmentary. It is either the most primitive known member of the snake lineage or perhaps one of the most primitive known members. Uh, there's also these guys out here, things like Parvoraptor and relatives. In our analysis, they come out as even further down on the snake tree. They're probably basically uh, lizards that are just moving towards snakes if they are, but they're so fragmentary, we're really not sure if they're there or not. And in our analysis, the, uh, here the sea snakes actually go inside modern snakes. They're part of the crown, not part of the stem, so not really relevant to snake origins. 
So what are the evolutionary implications of this fossil? Well, first of all, I think it supports an out of Gondwana scenario for snake evolution. The deepest parts of the snake stem, the ancestors probably dispersed out of Laurasia into Africa, but I think this is where the snake body form originated. And we now have the oldest, most primitive member of the snake lineage in, in, South, in South America, <laughs> along with things like Najash in South America. And there's a highly diverse snake fauna in the mid-Cretaceous of Africa, and there's snakes in India and Madagascar. This strongly indicates uh, and together with, with ancient members of the, uh, the crown snake lineage that are found in Africa and South America today, strongly indicates that snakes come from Gondwana. And I think they're relics of a very bizarre Gondwana and herpetofauna. So the northern hemisphere here in the Cretaceous, it's dominated by lizards. Uh, there's relatively few lizards in the Gondwana at this time period. Instead, you have terrestrial crocodilians, the Notosuchians, snakes, and tuataras. And I think snakes are a relic of this weird a reptile fauna that evolves in the Cretaceous of Gondwana. In terms of the uh, fossorial versus uh, aquatic origin of snakes, uh, it has a very elongate trunk, a very short tail. This is a classic, uh, classic burrowing adaptation. You don't see this in aquatic animals. It has these very low neural spines, uh, neural arches. That's typical of burrowing animals. And we see zero evidence for aquatic adaptation. There's no tail fluke. There's no flippers. Uh, heavy pachyostotic ribs for ballast. You don't see that. There's no aquatic adaptations. I would argue that the fossils strongly support fossil reality. Uh, there's no strong evidence for marine <coughs> origins at this point, and I'd say effectively the marine origins hypothesis is dead. In terms of the evolution of feeding, it also has interesting implications. Again, we have these large recurved teeth. We have that joint that allows the jaws to expand. These are adaptations for carnivory. We don't just have to infer carnivory. We have direct evidence for it, however, in terms of the uh, gut contents. Early snakes were carnivores. They make that transition very early in their history. How are they capturing their prey? So we started looking at this. Uh, it has a very flexible sinuous spine. It kind of coils very tightly and a very high number of vertebrae. You don't see this in other long-bodied lizard lineages, which suggests it's not actually a locomotor adaptation. So what we suggested is it might actually be a feeding adaptation. The reason it has so many vertebrae and it's so flexible is to use the spine for constricting the prey, and it might actually be a constrictor. So how do the limbs fit into this? The limbs are really, really bizarre. Uh, they don't show any burrowing specializations whatsoever, as far as I can tell. Instead, you have these very, very <coughs> elongate finger and toe bones. They're all kind of the same length. Uh, this is typical uh, of things that use their limbs for grasping. These feet are like the feet of a, a bat or a pterodactyl. So we think they're using the limbs for grasping. And what we threw out there, and it might be the case or might not, we think they're using the limbs to grasp prey. Is after they start using the body for locomotion, they start stop walking with the <laughs> limbs, they're using them to subdue their prey. And so in addition to constricting the prey, they're kind of grasping them. And that gave us the name Tetrapodophus amplectus. So, Tetrapodophus means uh, fairly straightforward. It's Greek for four-footed snake. Amplectus is Latin for embrace. Uh, so he's the huggy snake. And here he's, <laughs> he's giving his little mammal buddy a hug and sending him to sleep. So, so what does Tetrapodophus tell us? Well, Tetrapodophus is the oldest definitive snake. As the first with four limbs, it bridges the gap between snakes and lizards. And it is really a remarkable uh, transitional fossil. And I don't think it's too much to say that this is one of these things that goes up there with things like Archaeopteryx or Lucy as helping to elucidate the origins of a, of a major clade. And it was really, it's really a phenomenal discovery. And it strongly, strongly supports the idea that snakes originated as fossorial animals, not as marine swimmers. It suggests that early snakes were carnivores and probably constrictors, using their body and perhaps their limbs to subdue their prey and they originate as part of a unique highly endemic herpetofauna that evolved in the Cretaceous of Gondwana. So uh, thank you guys, and thanks to everyone who helped with the study.